Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to sit before you today. As I said before, um, this is a problem I've been thinking about literally for decades. Are you old enough? Of course I am. Um, but the Constitution is an interesting thing, and I've always been a fan. Article 18 under the New Hampshire Constitution says penalties to be proportional to offenses and, the true and refers to the true design of punishment. It says all penalties ought to be proportional to the nature of the offense. No wise legislature will affect the same punishment to crimes of theft, forgery, and the like, which they do to murder or treason, where the same undistinguishable severity is exerted against all offenses. The people are led to forget the real distinction in crimes themselves and to commit the most flagrant with little compunction as they do to the slightest effects. For the same reason, a multitude of sanguinal, sanguinal laws is both impolitic and unjust. The true design of all punishment being to reform and not to exterminate mankind. <coughs> I am sorry <coughs> to say that when you look at the combination of laws in this state, regulations and statutes, we have 11,000 pages of rules and regulations and judges who will remind us that ignorance of the law is no excuse. We, as a society, have chosen to enter into a form of, constitu of a constitutional republic for which we delegated the ability and nature of government under that consent to be governed. Under Article 2, our part two, Article 5 of the New Hampshire Constitution, we delegated the ability to the legislature to make laws. And they said it was necessary uh, in defense and support of the government of the state and the protection and protection of the subjects thereof. <coughs> part first, Article 2 of our New Hampshire Constitution. It is my second favorite article in the entire Constitution says all men have certain natural, essential, and inherent rights among them which are enjoying and defending life, liberty, acquiring property, punishing and protecting property, and in a word, seeking and obtaining happiness. Sounds pretty good. It's actually kind of simple, right? We could only live so simply. However, Article 3 says when men enter into a society, they surrender up some of those rights and they surrendered to that society. Do you know why? They didn't expect us to guess. They told us right here. They said, in order to ensure the protection of others. That wasn't enough. They said, and without such equivalent, the surrender is void. A fascinating concept. I googled. I wanted to know when anyone had had the conversation about the surrender is void part. If I'm giving up my natural rights, why is it that, what am I getting in exchange? According to this, I'm supposed to surrender them for the protection of others. So, let me ask you, why is it that we are not looking at who the others are we're protecting when we are assessing our 11,000 pages of law. And if, when someone is being tried for a crime, we don't actually uh, pay attention to Article 15 of our Constitution. Now I know I'm referring to these by article, and so I'm gonna make life a little simpler for you, and say no subject will be held to answer for any crime or offense until the same is fully and plainly and substan substantiated and formally described to him compelling you're compelled to accuse or furnish evidence, and no one shall be uh, compelled to uh, furnish evidence against himself. 
every subject shall have the right to produce all proofs that are favorable to himself and to meet with witnesses against him face to face and full, be hope, fully heard. Can we for a minute? Yes, sir. This bill does not say a constitutional lesson. It says victimless crimes. I'm sorry? So you're repeating, you're reciting the Constitution to us. I want to know what you're going to do in the bill. I'm going to tell you that in just a moment. I'm trying to explain to you the construct and framework for which this I have presented this bill. And if you let me get two more sentences, I'll explain to you the rest. May I do that, Madam Chairman? How much more do you have? Two sentences. They're underlined right here. <coughs> Thank you. It says, every subject shall have the right to produce all proofs that may be favorable to him, to meet the witnesses against him face to face, and to be fully heard in defense of himself and his counsel. My bill, very simply, says, show us the victim. If you don't have one, then as an affirmative defense, there is no crime. The state itself is not a victim in these crimes under our constitutional consent to be governed. It's very, very simple. It was a long way to get down to one sentence. See, we have and have this idea of habeas corpus, produce the body. If someone's being detained, we bring them in and have the charges answered to them, and our people have the right to face their accuser. The accuser, however, should be a victim. We constructed our constitution to say we want to protect others. But if you have no victim there, who are we protecting? With that, I say 11,000 pages of law. If they have a victim, and that victim is, and it's listed plainly here, a person who suffers direct or threatened physical, emotional, psychological, or financial harm as a result of the commission of that crime or attempted crime is a victim. If you don't have that, then this is an affirmative defense. This doesn't take a single person off the road. This doesn't prevent a single arrest. It doesn't, it doesn't change any of the way the police do their job. It says there is one additional defense for a defense attorney to say, show me the victim, and then compel the legal system in prosecution to produce the person who was egregious. If there is no egregious party, if we cannot actually produce them, and they do not make an accusation face to face, then our um, accused have been denied their constitutional right to face their accuser. That's my argument, and I'm willing to take any questions. Could you describe a victimless crime? There are lots. One. Madam Chairman, I drove with an expired driver's license in the town of Litchfield in 1992. It was September 20th, I remember it well. My driver's license had expired on September 4th. They pulled me over, they wrote me a ticket, for which I paid the ticket. The next day, I drove to Concord, trying to comply with the law. I paid for my renewed driver's license. I then got a little yellow card and was told I had to show up for my appointment. I traveled regularly for work. I missed my appointment and had to go and while I had paid for my licenses and everything but had my picture taken and taken an eye inspection test, I got stopped again. And I handed them my card and they said, we're sorry, that's expired. And they wrote me another ticket. The reason is because my little yellow ticket was only good for 30 days, but when I went to go get my license, they said, you can't have it, you missed your appointment. I had to reschedule. I did that. When they stopped me for the third time, they detained me and arrested me in Nashua on the day I was going to get my driver's license picture at my appointment at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was arrested and detained. I had to have someone bail me out of jail. Now, if I've paid for my driver's license, I've complied with the law, and I'm trying to make my appointment, where was the victim? And why is it that they were going to charge me as being a habitual offender for, compel for committing the same crime three times, which was failure to get the piece of paper not to pay the tax? I paid my tax. I did my best to comply with the law and became a victim of this, and I became offended. I did research to try to find out why as a system of government I was detained and held behind bars for failure to not pay my tax or participate in the licensing process, but to have in my possession that piece of paper. When I presented my driver's license, which was expired, I was charged with a separate offense. 
which is presenting an expired driver's license. Did you know that's a worse crime than driving without one? Where's the victim? We have 11,000 pages of rules for which we have citizens who could be charged. Let's give them a reasonable defense. You say you're talking about a driver's license being a victim, right? Your, your episode was of a driver's license. What about a person that's restaurant or home is robbed and they're not present? They don't have to be present to be a victim. Any, any removal of property, uh, any theft of property, there's a victim. There's a clear victim. Not a problem. This is not about being there and witnessing. This is about if you have somebody who said, I was impacted, no problem. Uh, then I guess I don't understand what your bill is trying to do. Could you explain it to me other than your driving experience? Other than what you had. Tell me other victimless crimes that you've seen that people have been convicted for. I, I hear people talking about participation, uh, uh, victimless crimes all the time. If you have someone who's driving down the road at at three o'clock in the morning and is speeding, then they're uh, and they're not putting anyone at risk. Why is a speeding issue um, a something that we have a victim for? There, there is no one offended by the particular implementation of that law. And that's another example. There are hundreds and hundreds of examples. But you're, when you're speeding, you're breaking the law. The speed limit says such and such a thing. And you're breaking the law. You know that is the law, so you're not a victimless. That crime is a victimless. I would believe that in case she in case she asked me if I would. Um, I, I don't disagree with you on that particular point. Under Article 18 of the New Hampshire Constitution, which I read a moment ago, it says, um, for the same reasons a multiple multitude of sangui sanguinary laws is both impolitic and unjust. Our Constitution says if we have too many laws, they are unjust. This one gives us the ability to implement any that exist. For example, do you realize that we have an, a statute on the books today that makes adultery a crime, except for we can't charge anyone with it. Uh, the police won't, they wouldn't take a report against my ex-wife. Uh, Though during our divorce I tried to have her charged, I thought it would be really good, but they said, no, we can't take that. But we have these things on the books. But if they chose to, they could potentially charge someone. But where's the victim? Am I really? We need to make sure that laws that we have that are obsolete on the books are not enforced arbitrarily if we cannot produce a victim. <coughs> Plain and simple. Thank you. Hmm. Representative Ginsburg. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative uh, Wood. Uh, Private gambling among friends, would um, smoking marijuana, would prostitution be examples of victimless crimes? They would. Thank you. Can you cite, I'm sorry, may I follow? Oh, yeah. Can you list for us some other victimless crimes that you think uh, should have uh, this as an affirmative defense? Um, any, any crime for which there is not uh, someone who is willing to make a complaint against that particular crime, in my understanding and reading of the uh, nature of the Constitution, um, would prohibit, uh, this would create an affirmative defense. So can I list other ones? Um, there are lots of them. Um, you are aware, Representative, that the, in the state of New Hampshire, it is a privilege to have a driver's license. Yes, sir, I am. Thank you for asking. And I paid for my privilege. Uh, I didn't understand that when I went and passed the test and actually paid them, and they actually gave me that little card that said I possessed the privilege, that lack of that piece of plastic actually would revoke it. Uh, Representative, uh, you were quoting the con uh, Constitution. Does that come under that privilege of uh, being able to drive within uh, our state? 
I'm not sure I understand the question. But you were quoting the Constitution, how you have these rights and this and that. But, you know, that, I'm a little confused because I always thought that it was a privilege, not a right, to be able to drive with a license in the state of New Hampshire. Yes. Am I wrong or right? No, you're right. It is a privilege. It is granted by the state. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Thank you for my question. Uh, would you agree that prostitution and sodomy would be victimless crime? I would, actually. I did some research because I knew this question was coming up and I was very concerned about it. Um, and I would love to actually say that we have a solution to that problem now. There was a conference a couple of years ago where this was talked about in Las Vegas because they, you know, borderline with this all the time. Nye County, um, Nevada actually has a prostitution statute, but in Las Vegas proper they do not allow prostitution. There was a issue with the local police questioning whether or not um, Escort services, which did not offer sex but allowed people to negotiate um, consensual adult behavior, could actually be construed as prostitution. You know, where exactly do you draw the line between behavior of cons consenting adults? If there's money changing hands for two people to spend time together but there is no explicit contract for sex, is that prostitution was their question. Their answer when they analyzed it was that they were unable to figure out the distinction and that they have stopped charging people in Las Vegas proper for prostitution even though it is a questionable crime because they couldn't find a victim. However, when they actually passed this law, it enabled people who were potentially participants in <coughs> prostitution, which uh, also could result in other crimes like abuse. Those people were then able to come in and say, I was abused and file a complaint so that those people could actually get the protection of law, which is originally intended by the system that says we are going to protect individuals against crime for which there's a victim. If we have a victim, there's an easy charge. If not, and you have no one to complain, why is there? Would you believe that many people would choose to disagree when it comes to sodomy, that it has not affected society as a whole? I have no... Um, specific context for which to um, agree or disagree. I do know that um, the people who came to this nation to found it had this idea that they did not wish to be overly regulated or have their behavior dictated. They wanted freedom. They wanted the ability to live by themselves. And we have a old saying here in New Hampshire that is hundreds of years old. Good fences get, make good neighbors. And within my property, what I do is my business. This is why when you walk through the forest, you will find <coughs> these little stone walls that you can't explain. Because everybody separated themselves and they ruled and regulated themselves, came up with a constitution that allowed them the protection from the abuse of others, not from their consensual behavior. Follow-up, Madam Chair. Thank you. So what, what you're pretty much saying is that anybody that uses drugs or creates <clears throat> type of uh, creates uh, participates in the sodomy that that act would not affect society health wise. Actually, um, that would create a victim. Does it? Would it not? I, I don't know if it would, and if it would, then that would certainly be a concern. And if if the victim was willing to go out and make a complaint, then you know certainly they could be heard in court. And the problem that we have right now is that, as I said in the adultery statute, you know where is the victim? We have a defined crime, but if we can't present a witness, then there is no face-to-face -face challenge. You bring a face-to-face -face challenge, the judge will hear. This is not changing the way that we arrest. This is not changing the way that the police behave. This adds an exception and reasonable defense to a defense attorney that says, show me the victim. That's all we're asking for. That's all I'm asking for in the law. I believe it's clear in the Constitution that the intent and construction allowed us to have face-to-face -face challenges of the people who were accusing us and why they were harmed. We are a society that is constructed based on contractual agreement. The people of this state, based on their previous the pe previous residents, 
consented to be governed under these rules yeah. and regulations. That's a contract. If there's a violation of a contract, it should be heard in court. If there's not, why are we chasing these down? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Woman, Representatives. House Bill 1531 is against sound public policy. Passage of this bill would impact a number of laws. Uh, one of the laws that would impact would be the enforcement of drug crimes. And I have prosecuted drug cases for many years and people always say it's a victimless crime. And I would say, tell me how it's a victimless crime. Look at the number of homicides that we've had in this state, the number of burglaries, the number of robberies, and the number of assaults. It's sadly to say that there are a lot of times a drug or an alcohol component to it. Another crime is conspiracy. And that crime is an agreement in an overt act. So if I conspired with someone to commit a murder, we drove to the individual's house and found that they weren't home, well, I guess we'd get a free pass on that one because the person wasn't home. What you would want to dissuade was the agreement in the overt act to commit the murder. It would also eliminate a lot of the corrupt practices. So if you had individuals who are in political office who bribe somebody, well, where's really the victim there? I would say that every citizen in this state is a victim of that. The same thing for improper influence. Somebody testifying at a trial that gets up and raises their right hand and swears to tell the truth and nothing about the truth and then commits perjury. The question would be, where is the victim there? Unsworn falsification, lying to a police officer, Again, the same question would be, where is the victim? If somebody escapes from a prison, as we saw recently, and there was a manhunt, well, who's the victim there? Again, each and every one of the citizens that you represent is the victim. And for those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, to pass this bill is unsound public policy, and it harms every individual that you've sworn to uphold and protect and represent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. I know I don't. I don't have it. Casper, you're not the last person of the day. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Chris Casco. I'm an attorney for the New Hampshire Department of Safety. I hold the position of administrator of the Bureau of Hearings. I oversee the attorney hearings examiners and Department of Safety prosecutors. I'm appearing before you this afternoon in opposition to House Bill 1531. I do have a position paper which documents our position in detail, but I'll just give you a few highlights and then take some questions. And we do understand that this does create an affirmative defense. It doesn't legalize victimless crimes. However, it will have that effect if it becomes law. Because initially, the police may still charge these crimes and choose to litigate that in court and to allow the defense to assert this. But after how many trials where someone is found not guilty because this is a perfect defense to these crimes, Will the state then decide that our resources are better spent elsewhere and stop prosecuting these crimes? I think that is the consequence, is these crimes will no longer be prosecuted. Essentially, they will no longer be crimes if this bill passes. A couple of the victimless crimes that we think that are very dangerous to public safety in the Motor Vehicle Code, first, driving under the influence of alcohol or controlled drugs. If there's no crash, there's no victim. That behavior would be encouraged by this bill, creating a drastically dangerous situation out on our highways because people drinking and driving will know, hey, as long as I don't crash, I won't lose my license, I won't have to go to court, I won't go to jail. People will take that risk if there is no threat of prosecution for DWI. And I think the same 
can be said for just about any driving misdemeanor level offense. That will create a dangerous situation out on all of our public roads in New Hampshire. A couple of other examples, prostitution, gambling, and those are victimless crimes under the definition in this bill. However, <clears throat> some of the consequences of that behavior will have victims down the line. Prosecution or prostitution, you will have transmission of disease, you will have the enslavement of individuals for this trade down the line because there's no longer any prosecution. All of the drug offenses will go away. They'll be obliterated in the criminal code. Yet, drug offenses have consequences down the line. Addiction, theft to support habits will all result. Therefore, New Hampshire will become a place I don't think many of us would want to live in. It will become a safe haven for drug traffickers, for people who want to engage in illegal activity. So for all of these reasons, we strongly oppose this bill. It is bad for public safety. It is bad public policy. So I recommend that you ITL this bill. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being with us today. Would it be fair to say that it's the goal of law enforcement to stop crime before we have a victim? But under this bill, a law enforcement officer might be hesitant to act until there actually was a victim to the crime? Thank you, Representative. I think, yes, that would be the effect. Trying to prevent crimes will be very difficult under this bill. Essentially, the entire role of law enforcement will change to responding to victim crimes. Unfortunately, our troopers will be responding to crash scenes and prosecuting those. And we'll have many more of those if this bill passes. And just to follow up and make law enforcement reactive instead of proactive. Yes, I agree with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Martin Garabedi, and I'm the Chief of Law Enforcement for the New Hampshire Fishing Game Department. Uh, I am here today uh, opposing House Bill 1531 for the New Hampshire Fishing Game Department and the Fishing Game Commission. Uh, you have heard the issues involving the criminal code and motor vehicle codes. We also have issues relating to wildlife crimes that if this bill passes would cause some great concern in this state. I have written testimony I will provide to you, but I just want to give you a few examples of what would be an affirmative defense under this bill as written. Uh, people going out night hunting, shooting deer at night, where all wildlife belongs to the citizens of New Hampshire in the state of New Hampshire, who was the affected person in this instance. Also, the taking of moose and deer during the close season, and uh, also the uh, possession of illegal deer parts and moose parts. Also, uh, the misdemeanor uh, offenses as it relates to trespass issues where there is no individual that's directly affected along with uh, the DWI statutes of aggravated DWI statutes involving snow machines and ATVs. So Madam Chairperson and members of the House Criminal <coughs> Justice and Public Safety, we, uh, we respectfully urge you to oppose House Bill 13, uh, 1531. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Constantine. I'm here today representing NHJury.com. Our slogan is, no victim, no crime. 
I'd like you to know that I don't support theft, assault, fraud, or anything at all like that. I believe that I own myself, and I think everybody in here owns themselves. I think when we seek to own other people, that's when the beginning of the crime is perpetrated. I think before we talk about something that is criminal, I think we first need to define what a crime is. Some things will always be crimes, harming another person, theft, fraud, assault. Some things are prohibited, technically they're crimes, but I don't really think they are. It was prohibited to help a runaway slave or to hide a Jew in your attic in Nazi Germany. I break those laws today. <clears throat> What's a victimless crime? Somebody asked that. I think that's a good question. I think the answer to that, the easy answer is, a victimless crime is one in which the accused has not acted in a manner harmful to another. In other words, nothing was stolen, no property damage, no other party was hurt. No other real person, that is. Where we are now is the accused, in many instances, has broken some shall or shall not statute of law. In many of these cases, almost all of them, the state assumes the role of the victim. And no matter that in most of these cases, the accused is the real victim and the state is the assailant. Now, I'd like to point out in the body of the bill, uh, it doesn't negate any existing laws. It merely reinforces the concept that you're innocent until you're proven guilty. It places the burden of proving that there was a victim on the plaintiff, where it belongs. <clears throat> the highest prison population in the world, it's not Russia, it's not China, it's right here in the United States. I don't know how many laws we have in the United States. I mean, the gentleman sponsoring the bill said we have 11,000 laws here. I believe him. So I think I'd also like to point out that those opposing this bill, once again, there's no one here from the public. It's, it's those with a mercenary self-interest. All I want, and I think all, all the other people who are going to testify after me in favor of this bill, is to be left alone. That doesn't mean I want to harm other people or assault people or anything at all like that. I, I don't want to bring the conversation over there. I can tell you absolutely that when you do those things, you're committing a crime. Uh, somebody earlier today mentioned, I believe it was uh, somebody that testified from the Attorney General's office, that everyone in the state is victimized by some crimes. Well, then I would ask, what harm in asking just one of those victims to appear in court and prove that they were victimized? That's my testimony. Question. I did have a question. I may have a question. Absolutely. I'm just not quite sure how to pray, but. We'll go for it. When the Attorney General's office defends a law, they act for the people. So if they're bringing what you referred to as a victimless crime, mm -hmm. they are acting on behalf of the people of New Hampshire. Well, I believe. You're, you're framing the question as if what you're saying is absolutely true, and I think that's where our basic disagreement is. I think a lot of times um, they are, for instance, if, if I attacked you or stole your stuff, clearly I victimized you. If they're bringing a charge against me because I like to sit in my living room and not drink alcohol and, and maybe smoke a joint or something like that, and the attorney general wants to come and, and bring the state against me, they're not defending anyone. They're assailing me. There's, there's a pretty big distinction here. And I think in all of the testimony, people are going to run around, oh, there'll be chaos and people will be, you know, climbing trees and jumping on people's heads and doing all kinds of crazy things. That's not what we're here to, to discuss. That's not what I'm here to discuss. So if, if somebody says, oh, the whole state's victimized, just bring in a person and, and tell me who that person was that I harmed. 
And I think that there were some pretty good examples from the people who opposed this bill. Um, maybe there needs to be some refinement um, in, in this bill. But I think the idea that we have 11,000 laws, pages. I think 11,000 pages, thank you. Um, I think we ought, to, we ought to discuss that. Why do we have more people in jail than any place in the world? Those are valid concerns. Well, basically, we don't kill everybody we put in jail. <laughs> but, but it is an assault against them. And we do steal their houses. And we do steal their money. There was a woman here a couple of weeks ago. She's not here now. Her name is Patricia Smith. Her name is Patricia Smith. She never harmed anyone. She's going to go to state prison because she decided not to use alcohol, which is a more... Uh, it's a lethal substance. She decided to use cannabis, marijuana. And the federal government stole her house and ransomed it back to her. She had to give up $51,000. And now they're going to stick her in a state prison. It's a nice lady. She was assailed. She was assaulted. I was just wondering, you keep saying, well, the police and the attorney general have all yeah. But where are your victimless crime people? Where are they at? The people that you're saying, are all the victims, where are they at? About 86% of the people in jail in the United States are there for a so-called victimless crime. There's about 2.2 million, 2.3 million people in jail. I don't know how many people are on probation, but we have. So uh, I would say it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to find them, look around. Um, me, I'm, well, go ahead, sir. I, well, if you say all the victims, whatever victim was, people in jail, they had to go to jail for something they did. They're not considered victims. Wait a minute. They're, they're Wait a minute. That's, that's where. Crime. Okay. Vices are those acts which a man harms himself or his property. Crimes are those acts when one man harms the person or property of another. Okay. So. <coughs> You and I have a disagreement, and I come to you and I assault you. That's a crime. If you and I have a disagreement and I walk off and I go and I go to my house and I decide to engage in behavior, maybe this is 150 years ago, and, and I and I tell a black person that knocked on my door, yeah, come on in, I'm going to hide you from the law. I'm breaking the law. Whereas it's it's that type of thing. I think the distinction between a vice when you're, you're assuming that something that's legal is always moral, and we know that's not true, or at least I do, and I hope you do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I know, you know, many times you quote the Constitution, but do you think, believe that the, when the Constitution took place over 200 years ago, that many of the things in society has changed since then. And Certainly. if you look at the Constitution, mm -hmm. we the people, who's protected we the people? That's two questions. Okay. I, I believe that the concept of freedom is never changing and it's constant. I believe that, uh, that what's happened is we have way more laws than we used to that violate the Constitution and our natural rights. So yes, there have been changes. We, have, we didn't used to have the most people in jail of any country in the world. Now we do. So I'll agree with you that things have changed. And who's protecting we the people? Um, I think that when there is one of those we the people that's aggrieved, all they need to do is show up and say, I was victimized in this way. And if they were, I'm, I'm not here saying I want things to be held to skeleton. I don't, I don't take things that don't belong to me. I don't harm other people. I don't commit fraud. Or I try not to. So I'm all for prosecuting something that I consider a real crime. But when something is just a prohibition that really doesn't have anything to do to a real crime, I think we need to question that. Uh, I think this is something I want to hand in. Um, it, well, go ahead, sir. Uh, one follow-up I made. Uh, you know, going back, you know, because I things were said about mm -hmm. Constitution, etc. cetera, uh, are our people elected the House of Representatives in this country? Excuse me? The people are elected. Are uh, the people that go to the House of Representatives, are, are they elected by the people? Tyranny of the majority? 
Well, let's talk about that. Last year, the people of the no. Senate. Uh, we are not going to engage in debate. Okay. okay. Well, I, I want to no. get to it. No. It's not a debate. They were doing the same thing here. Yeah. Sir, if you'd like to have a debate, give me your name after. We're looking to have a couple of people's debate uh, candidates. So. Uh, again, we have three branches of government. Do you agree with that? Um, there are three branches of government, the judiciary, the legislative, and that was executive. done by the Constitution with the people that enacted the Constitution I'm familiar of the country. With that, yes. Do we have rights or not under them? Um, not under them. Our, our rights aren't bestowed. They're supposed to be protected. Some of them are enumerated in the Constitution. Thank you. Thank You're you, Uh Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. My name is Lewis Miller. I'm a resident of Rochester, New Hampshire. I'd like to begin by thanking the Honorable Mr. Lambert, Mr. Moose, Mr. Warden for their introduction and sponsorship of House Bill 1531 and to the New Hampshire House of Representatives and Committee for Criminal Justice Public Safety for the opportunity to speak today in support of this amendment to RSA 262, Chapter 2. New Hampshire has a proud tradition of respecting individual liberty. And this was the most important factor for deciding to move my family here and become residents of this state. When he wrote On Liberty in 1859, John Stuart Mill understood keenly that the sole motivating principle of a government that respects individual liberty is that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community is to prevent harm to others, and that no one should be forcibly prevented from acting in any way he chooses, provided that his acts are not invasive of the free acts of others. This is the self-same principle of liberty upon which the governments of the United States and the state of New Hampshire were founded. It is the infliction of harm upon another person that makes an action wrong. It should be the sole focus of our, our government to protect the liberty of the people and the victim victims of crime. I believe that House House Bill 1531 achieves this purpose admirably. If there's no individual victim who can be shown to have suffered demonstrable harm, then there is no crime. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I understand under this bill, if I wanted to have a member of this committee killed because they asked too many questions in hearings, <laughs> and I thought I was talking with a hitman, but instead I was talking to an undercover police officer. The officer could not arrest me for planning this murder because there was no victim. But if I did contract with a hitman and had somebody in this committee killed for asking too many questions, then they could charge me. Is that correct? <laughs> I believe that, that 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 would constitute the direct threat of harm to an individual, and then there could be shown to, to be a victim of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Do you have written testimony? I, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sam Langley. Langley. Sam Langley. Yes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will be very, very brief. I put my card in supporting this bill, however, I'm on the fence. Uh, I can fix that. <laughs> 
uh, I think this, we, we have a number of situations in law that I don't think we should be prosecuting, and I think this bill would address that. There are, however, some, some things that uh, previous speakers have identified as being problems, which undoubtedly are problems, and they are afraid that this bill would allow some of these problems to run rampant. I'm not completely sure it would, but nevertheless it's a concern. Uh, what I think I am going to uh, request that the committee consider, given the fact that we're halfway through the session at this point, and there is no second session of uh, this legislature to refer the bill to for further work, that Thank you. Uh, the ones of you that run again next this fall and are successful, perhaps we could all get together before next session and uh, uh, come up with something that would address the concerns of both the opponents and the supporters of this legislation. And I would be happy to work with you uh, when this session is over and you all have more time to uh, accomplish that. Uh, be happy to try to answer any questions. And, uh, thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you very much. Representative Uh, Norman Tregenza, Madison, Carroll County. <clears throat> the question was asked by my friend and our colleague from Concord uh, about if, for example, somebody undercover was conversing with uh, an intended, uh, someone who was planning to be a villain and, and knock off whoever it is that's asking too many questions in, in committee. And <clears throat> if, if there's an intended victim, then, then there's an intended victim. So um, it places the, the burden of proving that there was a victim, um, and, and that, I think that's the difference. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I and I forgot to say that that I think by including that language of intended victim into the, the bill, that the bill could go forward as it is. Oh, we have questions. Question. Question. Representative Norman, you've got questions. <laughs> like, don't make a deal. Okay. Representative Price, then Representative Antos. Uh, thank you, Representative. Okay, my question. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, you sit on fishing game, correct? Yes. Okay. If someone on the current fishing game statute catches one fish too many, is that a victimless crime? Legally speaking, uh, I, it, the, the fish are the property of the citizens of New Hampshire. Is that a victimless crime? No. That was the question. I, I don't know. 
Um, I just wanted to clarify what Representative Shirtwell was talking about. Was that a direct threat or was that an indirect threat, third party? Well, if I understood what he said correctly, he basically said that if, if somebody came up to him uh, uh, or, or if, if there was one person who, who was planning to, uh, to take the life of another person uh, and, and the, the person who was planning to commit the crime said this to somebody undercover, then the person who heard it undercover could not use that in, in court. Did, did I understand that correctly? Right. So, um, but because there was a genuinely intended victim, um, The crime hadn't been committed, but that doesn't mean that there was not an intended victim. Uh, it clearly states here it has to be a direct threat. That would be an indirect threat. I understand that in law, it would be affirmative defense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Bill McGonagall again. Happy to give an article time. Oh, Bill McGonagall Plainfield. So. Oh, okay. I was going to get to that. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Bill McGonigal of Plainfield, and I'm here today to testify in favor of House Bill 1531. I'm sure you'll hear many important points today about how government is instituted to protect us from each other, that just government arises from the consent of the governed, and how the natural right of defense enables a just government to provide for the mutual defense. Our Constitution has specific requirements for just incarceration, namely to reform. These are all good points, and true. However, I wish to add a slightly different perspective from perhaps a more pragmatic angle. I'll focus on that point and try to be brief. I would like to bring to the committee's attention the incarceration rate in New Hampshire and illustrate how it compares to some other states and countries around the world. And in my written testimony, I've got some charts and graphs. I'll pass the response around. According to the standard measure, New Hampshire imprisons 220 individuals per 100,000 residents. The number in isolation doesn't have much meaning, but for comparison, Massachusetts has an incarceration rate of 218 per 100,000. It's pretty similar, yet who would suggest that the level of crime in Massachusetts is similar to that in New Hampshire? Further down this list, so New Hampshire is at the top here, I'm working down here. So further down the list, we'll find Minnesota at 179, Maine at 151, but not before we pass the narco states of Mexico and Colombia, and Saudi Arabia and Turkey. So to be fair, Saudi Arabia, one <coughs> might think that the execution rates might keep the incarceration rate down, but Turkey hasn't executed anybody since 1984. Next, we'll find Australia at 133, then Canada at 117, but not before passing the repressive regime of China at 122. France marks the halfway point at 109. And we should stop to ask if New Hampshire is a place with twice the criminal activity of France. Below the halfway point, we'll find Italy, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, <coughs> Ireland, Norway. And then Finland incarcerates one third the number of people that New Hampshire does. All these countries have abolished capital punishment. So what's going on here? To be sure, New Hampshire isn't the worst offender among the United States, and the U.S. rate at the federal level is much worse. But there's clearly a problem here. New Hampshire men aren't somehow more evil than their European counterparts, and these European states aren't suffering from rampant crime waves that we're somehow avoiding with our overflowing prisons. As an aside, that's something to consider in light of the county-level controversies about having to build new and larger prisons. But Perhaps the incarceration rates correlate with reduced crime, so the state has a vested interest in such high levels. Again, this can be shown to be untrue by way of comparison. For example, 
When comparing crime rates between New Hampshire and Switzerland, major crime indicators are very close in scale. I have data in a table in my written testimony that has actual figures. The similarity of the crime rates between New Hampshire and Switzerland is likely more illustrative of a universal aspect of human nature than an effect of a particular legal system. Because other Western countries prosecute victimless crimes less, they don't, and they don't have staggeringly different crime levels than New Hampshire, and the magnitude of the incarceration rate is shown here to not significantly reduce crime, we must consider the effectiveness of our incarceration rates in the prosecution of and imprisonment for victimless crimes. Now, it's possible that the legislature could spend the next 20 years going through the state statutes with a fine-tooth comb to find all these offending statutes, and that's probably a good idea anyway. Whether that kind of long-term project can actually be accomplished in a political environment where control of the legislature tends to slip every four years and the parties tend to abandon the projects of the other guys, I'd like to think it could happen. I'm not really sure. But in the meantime, this legislature has the responsibility to ensure that injustice is not being brought upon the people of New Hampshire. With our existing statutes, over that same 20-year period, it's very likely that the state will imprison hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals for committing these so-called crimes that have no victim. And it won't reduce crime rates or protect other people. House Bill 1531 offers a way out of this bind by allowing defendants to offer as a defense that the alleged crime had no victim. Besides saving the taxpayers a tremendous amount of money by not prosecuting and incarcerating all these vigils on individuals unnecessarily, sometimes paying for welfare for the families if uh, they're uh, the main provider, it would start us down the path of bringing New Hampshire in line with more appropriate crime control measures, as established empirically by the example of the entirety of the rest of the Western world. House Bill 1531 doesn't instantly solve all our problems, and I like to think it would be a stopgap measure until our statutes can be straightened out. But it does give the people of New Hampshire a realistic chance at a fair shake of justice in our state. And as I hope I've shown here today, it does so without the risk of increased levels of crime. Thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Do you have any statistics on how many people that are being incarcerated in the state of New Hampshire that are originally from New Hampshire but didn't come across the border because we have, we border quite a few states and crime doesn't stop at the border, would you believe? I don't have those statistics. Um, I have statistics about the, the, level, the levels of crime that are committed in New Hampshire. And my assumption would be the people that we imprison in New Hampshire are there for committing crimes in New Hampshire. Well, well, I mean, so you, what you're telling me is that all of the people that you have there on your statistics came from New Hampshire? If they're in here, they committed a crime in New Hampshire. Okay, so I they committed the crime in New Hampshire. It doesn't necessarily mean that. It doesn't necessarily mean okay. that. I, I, it's I'm the, just trying to clarify How many that. crimes are committed in New Hampshire, which is very similar to crimes that are committed, say, in Switzerland, and and the, and the relative uh, incarceration rate based on those crime rates. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Jeremy, Jeremy Olson. Um, Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I have two parts of my testimony. One, I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance to say that we support this bill. And most of the points that we would have made have already been made by some of the other people that testified, so I'm going to defer that testimony. One part that I would like to talk about is um, many points are brought up today of things that, of bad acts that would be made ostensibly legal if this bill were to pass. And um, in many cases, that's not actually true if minor modifications were made to this law. Um, the pub somebody brought up the idea that the public corruption statutes would become unenforceable if this bill were to pass. You could, um, you could fix that situation if you were to allow people who were individually aggrieved by those corruption, by that corrupt act, to bring a lawsuit. For example, if somebody living in a representative's district 
was aggrieved by that crime, then they could bring a lawsuit against the person because they would be the actual victim of it. Um, somebody brought up the act of sodomy, and in New Hampshire, sodomy is not illegal to begin with right now. There's no statute on the book in New Hampshire against sodomy. It's consensual. So that wouldn't even really apply to, to this bill. The um, situation with wildlife, if you were to create a property interest in wildlife, if people could claim ownership over the wildlife, then wildlife that were taken would be a crime against somebody's property. They could bring a lawsuit or they could bring a, a claim of theft against that. Um, attempts such as somebody attempting to carry out a hit or something like that, that's actually covered in the text of the bill, is that it does directly say that the attempted commission of a crime would still be covered by this law. So if you commit a murder, there's clearly a victim. If you attempt to commit a murder, there's a victim under the wording of this statute. Um, it also, in the statute, it mentions um, threats. It doesn't actually say direct threats. It just says direct, direct um, physical, emotional, psychological, or financial harm, or threatened physical, emotional, psychological, or financial harm. So the threats could be indirect. They could be through a police officer. They could be through a third party. If somebody were to threaten to kill me through a third party, I could have a claim of emotional harm against them, even though the act never took place. Um, somebody mentioned prostitution, how prostitution creates victims and that it spreads diseases. So does other consensual sexual activity that does not involve the transfer of money. Just people being promiscuous can spread disease, but that's not illegal currently. So that's not really a problem that would be inherent in legalizing prostitution through passing this bill. The idea of people being kept as sex slaves for prostitution, again, that's not so much a problem with prostitution as the fact that it's prostitution is illegal, so it creates that type of crime to begin with. If it were legal, that could be handled separately. Currently, it's legal for somebody to open a business to manufacture products, but if they were to try to open a sweatshop and force people to manufacture products, that's illegal currently, that would be the victim. It wouldn't be the actual prostitution, but the act of keeping somebody as a slave, that would be the, the victim of creating crime. Um, trespassing is also a similar issue, and that's a crime against somebody's property that could be considered financial harm or emotional harm or physical harm, depending on what they do when they trespass. So that, again, there would be a victim if that activity were to be conducted. So um, if this bill were to go to a subcommittee for amendment or anything, I'd be more than happy to work with the committee on that, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you believe that the section of prostitution that causes the prostitute to become a victim who is threatened physically, emotionally, psychologically, and financially? If somebody's threatened or forced into prostitution, that is definitely a victimful crime and should be prosecuted as a crime. They've been harmed. The, the situation is there are people who consensually engage in prostitution. Not everybody is a sex slave. Not everybody is being forced by a pimp into engaging in prostitution. Two questions. Number one, when we talked about this issue with a hit man, mm -hmm. If I were to hire you to do something, wouldn't you be a victim of my thoughts simply if you got caught? It didn't matter whether you carried it out, but you were part of that conspiracy, so you'd be a victim. Are you asking that I would have a cause against you under the no. law? You would be a victim, wouldn't you? I see, I see what you're saying, yes, I, I believe that would be correct. Okay. Second question. When you talk about wildlife law, currently, in statute, all wildlife in the state of New Hampshire is put into public property, public trust, to be enforced by wildlife laws. So that's already in the statute. So my analogy of one fish too many would be a theft of that part of that public property. I would agree with that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, but I was going to write this up in email. <laughs> Close. Thank you.
My name is Rich Angel. Angel. Yes. Pronounced Angel, Old English spelling. Two okay. L's. Okay. I'd like to address a few things that were brought up. We learned from the Declaration of Independence that our rights are endowed by our Creator. They're not given or taken away by government. They may be respected or violated by government, but they come from our Creator. And we also learn from the Declaration of Independence that governments are instituted among men to secure these rights. Once the government enacts and enforces laws that are supposedly designed to protect us from ourselves, tyranny has already commenced. And now it's just a matter of degrees. I've heard it said that there are certain laws where someone like me might say there's no victim, but that in fact society is a victim. Well, I contend that society is a fictitious <coughs> construct. It doesn't exist. And if I'm wrong, if it does exist, then it certainly should be put on the stand to testify against the defendant. I've heard it said that drug laws, that if this were to pass, then all of a sudden there would be a huge problem because now all of a sudden you've got unenforceable drug laws. I'd like to remind you at this point that prohibition never has worked and never will work. We learned in grade school that prohibition was a huge mistake. And yet here we are, just a few generations later, with prohibition fictitiously or erroneously called a war on drugs, which is really a war on people, and which kills far more people than drugs themselves. If somebody is driving on the road in a reckless manner, whether it be because they've been drinking or otherwise, that is a threat. That person is endangering other people on the road. And I don't think anybody here would excuse that kind of behavior. But since it was brought up, let's talk about another kind of another way that drinking laws are enforced, where there is no victim and no potential victim. If somebody walks out of a bar intoxicated in the middle of the night, too cold to, to sit in the car, and too intoxicated to drive, that person could be arrested for simply turning on the motor to start the heat to sit and wait for sobering up. A person traveling down the road who realizes, uh-oh, I shouldn't have gotten on the road, I've been drinking too much, pulls over to take a nap, can be arrested for drunk driving. That's an example of a victimless crime being enforced. In any case, the chaos that is been fed to us by all the bureaucrats and law enforcement representatives who are against this law. I cannot tell a lie. I have completely lost my train of thought. You know what happens to us all? I know it's not. But I had a question for you. Please Please better help. Help. Yes. The gentleman that was driving felt that he should pull over. Right. If he took his keys out of the ignition, would he still be charged with drunk driving? He took his keys out of the ignition, threw them on the floor of the car. It's been known to happen. People have been known to go to prison for pulling over, knowing that they're too drunk, 
these, these kind of things that ha happen. And what I was starting to say, got my train of thought back, is that this law is not, to, is not designed to throw every little victimless crime out the window. It's designed to offer an affirmative defense. It's, in other words, it's reminding the jurors of their right to judge the law as well as the facts and controversy. Is there a victim? Was somebody endangered? <coughs> Etc. And I think that these bureaucrats and law enforcement agents who are coming in here to, to, to dissuade you from passing such a law, I think they're protecting their careers more than anything. And they're not trusting the people. They're telling us that they're smarter than we are, and they know better than we do about who should or shouldn't be prosecuted and not end up being another statistic, that being that America has more prisoners than any other country in the world. No, but I'm sure if you do, if you go online and do a YouTube search, you'll get my testimony. Okay. I don't do that. All right. Okay, are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your time. William Foster. <coughs> Yes, I, I sprained my ankle. It's mostly better. I'm just keeping weight off of it so I don't re-injure it. <coughs> was that a victimless crime? Uh, that was entirely my fault. So uh, I, I victimized myself, which is interesting because um, in many cases, the state uh, actually tends uh, to prosecute people for harming themselves. And um, that's a very strange dichotomy. I'm not going to get into that. So I just, <clears throat> for one, would like to point out the stark difference between this bill and the one that you're going to be considering next. Because I feel that this one represents government in its proper role, which is to protect the rights of individuals. And the next one is exactly what's wrong with the country. People and government attempting to micromanage our lives instead of representing us. They keep talking about all of these laws, thousands and thousands. You're the legislature. Do you know all of those laws? I'm positive that you don't. I'm positive that I don't. The Wall Street Journal recently published an article called We're All Felons Now, in which they documented that the average American commits three felonies per day. You don't know the laws. You don't know which ones you're breaking. There are so many federal, state, county, local ordinances Every regulatory agency now has uh, rules that have the force of law. And everything you do, you're, you're just regulated. Um, and and <clears throat> it's, it's really amazing to, uh, to see what it's come to. On the, on the DWI, I do want to mention, um, there was a case right before I moved here from Arizona where a couple was having a cocktail party. And they were having a disagreement between them. They didn't want to fight in front of their guests. So they went outside to argue. And in, in Arizona, it was 120 degrees. So they sat in the car uh, to argue with the air conditioner on. And uh, the neighbors um, called the police because the music from the party was too loud. The police came. Uh, they were in their car, uh, only running it because the air conditioner was on, did not intend to leave their party. And yes, they were both arrested and charged with DWI. So, um, some of those laws, um, again, while intending to protect us, things have just gotten really out of control. Um, there was some question as to what is and is not a victimless crime, and I think that's just kind of getting hung up on the title of the bill. If you dig down into it, and, and it's pretty straightforward and to the point, if the state can produce a victim, then there's a victim, if they can then there's not. And that's, that's really all there is to that. Um, I don't, I'm not the only one to point out that the only one testifying against this uh, are people who work for the state. 
and uh, I've had the opportunity to speak to officers in the field during arrests for victimless crimes, and we're pointing out that the person they were arresting hadn't harmed anyone or stolen anything or damaged any property. Um, the typical response is, well, I don't write the laws, I just enforce them, or don't blame me, talk to the legislatures, it's their fault. Yet they're here day in and day out campaigning for the power to continue making these victimless arrests. The three branches of government were mentioned and how they represent the people. So that's the question. I think it's clear the way the people feel about this bill and the question is, is the legislature going to represent the people or is it going to represent the executive branch? Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Clary Blum, the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union. And when I first saw the title of this bill, I thought, uh, a bill I can go in and support. Not so much. <laughs> um, the, the first reaction I had when I read the, ball, uh, the bill was, what does this do to the stalking laws and to harm by intimidation? And I, that raised a, a red flag with me. I don't know the answer. Um, I suspect the people on this committee will find out. Um, the members of this committee know that I support the decriminalization of a lot of things that I believe to be victim victimless crimes. Among them, marijuana, prostitution, adultery, other drugs, and hemp. Then it takes hemp. I would like to see all of those removed from the criminal statutes. But the description by the supporters of this bill is that a victimless crime is a crime that has not harmed another person. In my view, laws are passed to prevent harm. It does no good to have laws that punish after an individual is harmed. And an example, DWI is a perfect example. If you say someone who drives drunk and doesn't crash, that that is a victimless crime, then the numbers of people hurt and killed by drunk drivers is going to skyrocket because there will be many more people driving drunk. I don't think that ought to be under the definition of a, of a victimless crime. Speeding is exactly the same. You're going 100 miles an hour, up or down 93 or 89, eventually you're going to kill someone. <clears throat> and the fact is, unless you do, you are being arrested for victimless crime. There are also, I think, <coughs> unintended consequences with this bill. That's my favorite thing to look for because it's always such fun. And the, the recent Supreme Court decision in Citizens United established that corporations are people too. So a person is not just the people in this room. A person is now a corporation as well. And I would remind you, and I'll, it'll only take 30 seconds, I would remind you of the history of marijuana, which was legal until 37. And the reason it was made criminal in 37 was because the liquor industry lost three and a half million cup, uh, uh, customers to the pot industry while liquor was illegal. And so they made reefer madness and the Congress passed it. The fact is, a corporation is a person who could suffer direct financial harm from almost anything. Competition, putting another store on the block, that is a person who would suffer direct financial harm under the, under the circumstances of this law. <laughs> Madam Chair, as I said, I thought I was going to come in here and, and support this bill, and regrettably, I do not. I think that laws that protect us from harm are the laws that keep us a civil society. If we don't have them, I fear for our future. And I thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any written testimony? <clears throat> this is really bad. I've got little hair. No, I never <laughs> Are there, is there anybody else who didn't put in pink? I'd like to speak. If not, thank you. This hearing is closed.
Do you want me to get Representative Gandia? Yeah. Want me to get Representative Gandia for the next bill? Gandia is oh, yeah. the sponsor of the next bill. Thank you.